Welcome to Metal Arc is 54. We don't quite have a name for this. Maybe it's a farewell to memes, perhaps. I don't know. We're going to talk Twitter. Um, Kate Fagan is here, as always. Amin Al Hassan is here. I'm Howard Bryant. And uh, this is Metal Arc is 54, honorary captains for 54. Um, I would say uh, Zach Thomas, middle linebacker. I would say Brian yeah. Erlach. You could go Jeremiah Trotter, Goose Gossage. Um, there's if you're mm-hmm, mm-hmm. get another he 54 shall, out there he who shall not be named played for the and, knicks missed 17 layups in a row oh that'd be charles, charles smith. smith and then no, also not this has got to be not this has got to be the charles smith episode it's got to be it's got to be the show. honorary captain is charles smith uh no disrespect to goose gossage horace grant uh jeremiah trotter and the other 50 and car 54 where are you old school television <laughs> um elon musk has purchased twitter some people have left many people have left many 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 more have stayed um i think there's a few things here for us that you know i i think is really good uh grist for us professionally to talk about one sort of just thoughts about what this means for uh the service and uh, how you came to it um how you feel about what's what um, also the professional implications of staying going, staying true to values and um, all of the things. So let's let's jump. I mean, this has been in the works for a long time. What is what was your one? What is your Twitter philosophy? I know mine is Twitter exists to get you fired. But when <laughs> this when this was happening, what were your thoughts? And now that it's here, what are your thoughts? Well, uh, for me maybe the last three years or so, maybe maybe more, I, I kind of lost track. Twitter ceased to be what it used to be for me, which was genuinely a place of discourse and and jokes and, you know, sometimes arguments or a lot of times even arguments, but there was some balance to it. And in the last three years, I just realized it's like all Twitter is, is maybe not to the extreme of what you're talking about, Howard. All it does is exist to get you fired, but... All it does is exist to create conflict and argument on everything. If I say, man, I really love oranges, and nothing like a good orange. Oh, what about me? apples, motherfucker? Yeah, exactly, exactly, right? <laughs> and and either that or, huh, he's, he said orange, but actually he's holding a tangerine. He doesn't even know. To, like, God, it's not everything is an opportunity to either demonstrate your expertise or voice your protest. Sometimes statements are just statements. Um, apricots would like a word right you know so so that increasing kind of tenor to the entire platform it seemed like no matter what the conversation was about because the thing is i saw it bleed over to if you're talking about entertainment hey i i, I really love uh this marvel movie oh it's, it has got nothing on ant-man versus wasp or whatever i'm like <laughs> all right like that's not what i'm saying i'm just saying i really like this one um, whether it was sports, obviously, a great hotbed for debate, was, and then politics. And it just got so tiresome for me that I end up now, for me, Twitter is a place where I promote my work, I engage with people who are consuming my work, and I have a specific list of kind of newsbreakers slash people who write things I like to read. That's it. I, I'm the day-to-day conversations, the jumping in. Hey, oh, oh, they're talking about the best kind of uh, bunt cake there is. Uh, I don't engage in any of that, even if I find the conversation to be interesting, because I know inevitably it devolves into something uglier. So when everyone was like, "Oh, Elon Musk is going to take over and everything's going to be so much worse," I'm like, "How much worse could it be? It's already trash. It's been trash." One yeah. <laughs> to say a Twitter meme leading into Kate Fagan. Um, One's got to go. You're up, Kate. (laughs) Yeah. Okay. So, you know, Howard, you and I were talking about Twitter and Elon Musk and philosophy and usage a few days ago. So I've been thinking about this leading up to Metal Larker's Charles Smith. And, okay, here's my, you know, here's my kind of overall theory on Twitter. And stick with me here. I don't know if the two of you know, but um, Bill Murray lives in Charleston, South Carolina. Is that the thing that you, okay. So next time you see him, tell him I absolutely loved him in the French dispatch. I I will do that. Um, Tell him the same thing for Ghostbusters. 
Okay, I will do both of those things. Is there any other movie that we should tip a no. cap to? Caddyshack, Lost in Translation. Okay. All of the- and so he he is a part owner in the Charleston River Dogs, the local minor league baseball team. This is all setting up the fact that my wife's family also is a small part owner in the Charleston River Dogs. So our paths have crossed with Bill Murray routinely. And early on, the first time I ever met him at like a River Dogs game, either he said this or my wife passed it along because of his fame. And I would say he's almost like even beyond a list at this point, right? He's some sort of like floating above that right. um, and in like a mystical character. Um, he suggested that when he meets somebody, their true self is instantly revealed because of the way they react to him. If you are somebody who is standoffish, he can tell immediately because you're kind of whispering in the corner. He just he is suggesting that that level of fame allows an instant revelation of the person. And I've always tried to figure out if I agree with that statement because my reaction to him was like instantaneously trying to not be somebody who is, I try to pretend that he's not Bill Murray and act completely apathetic to the fact that he is a famous movie star, which maybe is revealing something about me. But I share all of this to say that like, this is how I, I feel similarly about Twitter. I feel in the same way Bill Murray thinks that like, you know, his fame reveals people. I think, you know, if you how people react and how they act and how they react to things on on Twitter is a full revelation, not a full, but I think it could be a revelation of who they are. Right. Like, I mean, when I first got to know you through Twitter at ESPN, you were in there throwing blows with people. That's kind of who you are. Right. I mean, like and I I, I don't know how many like weekends or like five o'clock time periods I've spent. And I think I have a tweet, but I don't think I've looked at it from every angle yet. <laughs> and I and I called my mom and read the tweet to her oh. and asked for feedback <laughs> about whether I should send it. And I think that reveals something about me. I don't say anything on Twitter unless I have like vetted it at every level because I am the kind of person I don't need. I don't want backlash. I don't want to spar with people. I don't want Howard. You weren't here, but Amin was sharing how he made a WWE joke that was in metal Larkers 43. Like I don't do stuff like that to my own detriment. Like I don't, I don't build followers. I don't gain traction on Twitter, but I also don't shoot myself in the foot. This is all a preamble to say that, I would say about five years ago because of this, because I, I don't want to be calling my mom vetting tweets at five o'clock on a Friday. I just was like, this medium is not a place where I'm going to excel. And so I've just been in neutral on Twitter for about five years. But that brings us to the pertinent question at hand, which is now Elon Musk has bought it. And depending on how you feel about whether it's turned into more of a cesspool or if it could be any more of a cesspool, now it really, for me, raises the question again of if I'm already in neutral on Twitter, then why am I on it at all? And that is kind of teeing you up, Howard. And like, there are reasons I'm still on it. There are reasons I want it in my back pocket, even if I might go seven months without tweeting something. And that's the that's the tug of war I currently find myself in is like, even though I'm in neutral on Twitter, I'm still in a car and I still want the car in case I ever want to drive it. And I, and I'm not sure what, where I'm going to go with it. Yeah. I think it's really interesting. That's a really great point, Kate. And I sort of think that for, for me, uh, I only got a Twitter account in 2009 because ESPN had asked us to get Twitter accounts leading up to the 2010 Olympics. We were in Chicago doing the Olympic media scrum and leading up to the the 2010s in Vancouver. And they said it was a good idea for us to have Twitter accounts. I'd never used it. I know I think it had only been around for two years, but I'd never used it. And for me, I always felt like, like I think that you could always use the medium in however way you want to use it. And there are some people who use it as a one-way medium, like Stephen A, for example. I think Stephen A's got like, you know, a billion followers, but I don't think he follows anybody. Right. It's a one way medium for him. He promotes what he's doing. He says what he says. And then he leaves. Right. I don't even know if he does his own tweeting. I'm going to text the mask. You know, so he uses it as a one way medium. There are other people who use the medium 
to, you know, to build followers, to interact. Um, for me, I was really into it for three reasons. One, I like pop culture. And I, I sort of felt like um, it was good interaction. It made me laugh. I thought it was very funny. And I thought that there were people out there who were doing and saying things that I thought were really sort of interesting. And I thought this was good. I thought it was good interaction. Um, the other reason I had used it is in addition to the, the movies and the comic books and all that sort of stuff, I had also used it when I was thinking uh, about different columns that I wanted to write. I used to use Twitter as a test balloon, um, just as a way to think about an idea and to see if it was, I wouldn't say it was crowdsourcing, but I would say it was interesting to get different perspectives because my main massive Twitter use began right around the same time that all of this athlete stuff was happening, whether it was Trayvon and Ferguson and Kaepernick mm -hmm. and all of that, this is the sweet spot of all the time where I'd been on. And so there had been, it was a very, very fertile, very, very fertile site in terms of interacting with a lot of people. And then of course, the third thing that happened and then, then I'll get into the sort of the ancillary piece of it was also it sort of became as we're seeing a more, a greater decline of you know of newspapers it started becoming a, a front page for me like you would wake up and this is what people were talking about and you began to sort of and because it's such a time sensitive medium depending on when you got on it's a dynamic medium this is what people are talking about at this time and you could scroll down and it was almost like a um a dynamic front page for you and that all of those reasons adding a, a fourth reason which was suddenly very very prominent people were using it and you now journalistically had access to people whose phone numbers you didn't have you had access to right. to people i mean i've actually connected with a lot of people that i would have not whose numbers i would not have like i remember when i first met martina navratilova i saw her in wimbledon at 2012 and she was like, oh, hey, you're the Twitter guy. I'm like, that's how she knew oh, me. Wow. She knew me as the Twitter guy. Oh, no. Right? And I'm like, I don't know if that's a positive Back or negative. before that was a bad thing. That, back right? Mm -hmm. before, it could still be before it was a bad thing. And so there was a lot of professional utility to it. And then as the years have moved on, it especially as we started to get to the 2016 election, um, then it began, be, becomes, begins to take on some different characteristics. I deleted my Twitter account last week. And the reason why I did so was I think if Elon Musk had purchased Twitter as a business acquisition, I don't think I would have deleted my account, but I think it was a political acquisition. And I think that when you, when you start adding up where we are and how I feel about American journalism and how I feel about the public discourse and how I feel about all of these different things that we talk about, I felt like it was a destabilizing force. And I felt like, especially, you know, with the whole charging for the blue checks and all that other shit. And to me, what, what struck me about that piece of it was the reason why you have the blue check isn't so you can lord yourself over somebody else. It's so when Martina or <clears throat> Stephen A or Isaiah Thomas is tweeting, you know, it's them that right. there's there's something to that so you know that there's a legitimacy to it and to not have that or to charge for it or to sort of destabilize that adds to this age and era of of mis and disinformation that we're in and it just pulled me away from the medium and i was like i don't really want to be part of this anymore so it's interesting Howard, because i agree with you i don't think he bought it as a business acquisition i, I think he bought it as a means to exert influence but it's very clear as soon as you know he's actually gotten in control that he had no idea what he what he was inheriting or acquiring by evidence by him letting go of so many people and then almost instantly trying to hire them back um the the check mark part is, is pretty interesting because they said hey you know what we're gonna open up to everybody and and you subscribe if you pay you can have it we don't have to do the onerous background check to prove who you are that they used to do and then they realized wait a sec the blue check was not a status symbol in solely i'm sure some people looked at it as such but also it's a credibility uh, symbol right credibility symbol so then they they came back with this official tag 
which they put under people's names. So, for instance, Kareem Abdul-Jabbar probably has an official under him, so people know that's officially him. Uh, in addition to the blue check mark that he has, that he inherits, because if you had a blue check mark before, uh, you don't lose it. So I, I discovered this today. I did not lose my blue check mark. But other people who come in and pay for a blue check, if these are the actions of someone who doesn't know what they're doing, came in with a hot idea. Or a person who does know what he's doing. They, they, they wants to muddy everything and make everyone yeah. confused? Uh, maybe. Maybe. Right. I, I, I think that places a, a, a level of diabolical genius that I'm not sure he has. And I know, oh my God, I mean, he's a billionaire who started PayPal and tell, uh, look, man, I, I'm of the firm belief, more than now more than ever in my life, that these people aren't always that smart. They're, they're smart in certain directions. I don't think that requires... To that, to, the, to that point, like, I mean, I'm not the first person to say this, but like we have this assumption in culture that if you're a billionaire, it's you got there, it means your point. You got that way because you're smart. No, man, you got that way because you're greedy. Like, you, well, well, I'm not saying you, you can't smart. also be smart and, but like, there's there's a lot of smart people who at various turns have decided, I don't need that level of money, or I'm not going to make that decision to gather that much wealth. It's not inherently true that if you are, because he's a successful businessman, if we think he is, that means that he's a genius. I think I think yeah. intelligence is, is three-dimensional, right? You could be directionally intelligent. I'm really good at taking an idea and building it and making it into something better. I'm really good at making a movie. I'm really good at making a song. I'm terrible at managing my own money or I'm terrible at, you know, whatever. So I, I believe he's a smart man. I just don't think this level of, and, and, and Howard, I hear what you're saying. It's like, is it really that smart? I'm like, for the way this dude behaves, yeah, I think this is something that is above his intelligence level in that particular avenue. I don't think we're talking about intelligence here, and I don't think it takes a whole lot of genius or we're even talking about smarts at all. We live in a time of propaganda and disinformation and misinformation. And look at Kyrie Irving. I mean, every All we're talking about now is conspiracy theorists, conspiracy theories and everything else. And I think that the end to, to the point of the rich the more money you have, the more persecuted you feel. That's not genius. That is power. That is you trying to protect or create a level of influence. Like you said yourself, you thought he bought it as a place of influence. And one way to influence people is to, is to control the flow of information and how information, you know, it, it, it is no different than a ball player saying, I'm just using my platform, right? You have a level of influence here because of your social status. And so I don't think it's, I don't think it goes, I don't think you need to be in a secret bunker to create or to sow disinformation. I mean, I think it's something that powerful people have mastered ever since Vietnam and Watergate, that you know to undermine and the players are doing it, politicians are doing it, billionaires are doing it, corporations are doing it. They're all doing it. It's not something that requires a great deal of a blueprint. We already have the blueprint. I just think that the specific approach of obscuring what is real and what's not from through the, the construct of the, the check mark. I, I just I, I'm not sure if it goes I think to that. it's part of the purchase. I'm not mm -hmm. saying that the that the blue check is the be all and end all of the strategy. I'm saying the acquisition right. itself was yes. for this entire purpose. And the blue check contributes to that as a I mean, when he sent out the tweet, it was simply we're no well, it was something like we're no longer going to have like lords and overlords and whatever. It was some sort of he tried to frame this as some sort of class struggle. Um, that now we're going to open this up to some sort of public journalism. But if you follow oh. what he's saying and what he's done, there's no public journalism involved in this. Are, are you guys ready for this? This is a live update. I would have never guessed of all the Metal Arker episodes we've recorded, I would have never guessed to get a live update on this topic while we're recording it. So <laughs> someone just put, uh, Marcus Brownlee pointed out what I just talked about. There's now two verified check marks. One that shows next to your profile and replies and retweets and everywhere else. It means you're a Twitter blue subscriber. The other one, official, only shows up on certain profiles and on timeline. 
Then he uh, updates. It says, update, it's now gone. And Elon Musk re- replies to him, I just killed it. So the official thing that I just talked about now is the second verification thing is now gone, courtesy of Mr. Elon Musk as of five, five minutes ago, 10 minutes ago. Um, so what does that say about your point of disinformation once but, again? I mean, see, but like there's two ways to look at it. One is you could look at it with the cynical view of, see, this is all, you know, the bait and switch and all that and keep creating this turmoil in people's minds. And the other is, this guy's a disorganized fuck who doesn't know what he's doing and has ideas and demands on them. And then when they enact them and they don't work, people are like, what are we doing here? Oh, never mind. I mean, okay, I mean well, yeah, get rid of that. Well, well wait, how- wait, let me just ask a quick follow up. I mean, do you routinely check Twitter while we're recording Metal Larkers? Oh, no, that was a text message I just got. OK, yeah. so you do not check Twitter while we're recording. No, no, I, I don't check Twitter while we're recording. I, I do check text because I've got other things that are happening and I'm trying to. That's fair. To juggle. That's fair. But uh, my point is this. I don't give him the benefit or anybody the benefit of the doubt nearly as much as I think of what is the actual end result of the actions. It doesn't make a difference to me if you say, okay, well, that he's not an evil genius and he's just doing this because he's an unorganized fuck that doesn't know what he's doing. What is the end result of the action? Oh, yes, exactly what what we're talking about. Disinformation and propaganda. Or at least, at the very least, opening the door for disinformation and propaganda to find its way in. Let me ask you guys a different question. Do you remember the first time you learned something from Twitter? Because I remember the first time I got my news from Twitter, and it was 2011, and it was when uh, tweets started going saying they caught Osama bin Laden and they killed him. And I'm like, all right, whatever, Twitter people. And like an hour later, we got the, the president's about to address the nation, and I said, oh, my God. And he does that long walk up that long walkway up to the podium, and he says, you know, a, a team of Navy SEALs executed, da, da, da. and I'm like, oh, my God, it's real. This thing that was just people on Twitter talking an hour ago end up being the actual news ahead of, I remember checking CNN and, and NBC and Fox and going on websites, and nobody had any mention of it, but Twitter was a buzz about that. Do you guys remember the first time you learned something, breaking news variety, via twitter mine was the same as yours i mean yeah. seeing whatever and it was the rock right um whose brother was part of the special forces and it was the first piece of it you're right it was the first piece of information where you you assumed it was flawed yeah. And then it was and it and it gave you a whole new level of respect for what the medium could be in the same right. way that I mean, this is like less of a uh, impactful example. But, you you know, the whole like blue dress, white dress phenomenon of like yes. six yes. years ago. And that was a Tumblr creation. And it, meaning that, you know, meaning that's where it was first posted yeah. and then it made its way to other mediums and it made. And it made you understand what I don't spend time on, on on Tumblr, and I've never spent time on Tumblr. But like you started to understand, oh, that that's how that ideas, yeah, <laughs> exactly. That's how that's the kind of idea differentiated from Twitter that could happen on Tumblr. But I, I don't. I think that that what you, Howard, I want you to jump in with like the first thing you learned as well. But I mean, this question kind of is the foundation of a bigger picture conversation that we have touched on here at Meadowlark, which is, so the those folks who were talking about that Osama bin Laden had been killed and sharing it on Twitter, what is the end, like, capitalistic financial takeaway from being somebody who tweeted something first on Twitter, which is, at some point it was a novelty, and at certain points, your ideas on Twitter could lead to a book deal or lead to a column offer. But that well, that foundational piece is something that Elon Musk needs to navigate before he messes with blue checks, because it's like if there is no value in me bringing my ideas to Twitter first, 
then what like if and and I move them elsewhere or I don't engage in that like the granular level of tweeting to form ideas and share ideas and I only go to the long form piece right like I'm not I'm not going to tweet at all about my ideas I'm just going to wait and save them all for a book like people used to do Mm-hmm. Is there a world in which we we pull back to that where you're like, I'm not going to do this added content building because I can do this more long form longevity content building outside of it? Yeah, well, I think there's a couple of things that work. Well, to answer your question, I don't remember the first one, but it, but I remember that one. I don't know if that was the first or not, but it was an example of the evolution of speed of how important speed was. And I think now is a good time to transition into the journalistic and the professional implications of the site. Mm -hmm. And when we talk about this, that is no different than what would then be spawned by Shams and Woj and everybody else in terms of what this site was going to do. And remember when we were at ESPN, well at ESPN since I'm still there, um, we were then discouraged from being on being on Twitter. And then we were using our own site we were using shortstop we were using some but it wasn't nearly as effective and nearly as um widespread as twitter twitter immediately became a place for breaking news the speed of what that of what that site could do fundamentally shifted its importance and it fundamentally shifted who was going to be using it and so now all all of a sudden every company in the world now has a twitter page some of it used to be just for advertising but then it became a news site. It became a place for you to circumvent traditional media. You can get your message directly out, which is part of this empowerment that we're talking about. And obviously for the players to do the same, you know, they had Players Tribune for a little bit and then to go use Twitter directly and Instagram and all of the other different types of social media, the speed of it really, really did shift how information was going to be disseminated. And so what it also meant to what Kate was saying was there is absolutely a professional utility in having a Twitter page. I, you know, I was talking to Bomani about this last night. And I was saying that the biggest thing that Twitter did for me in the 13 years or so that I was on it was it alerted other competitors or other colleagues to my thoughts. So I don't know how much it actually moved the needle to the or the stuff that I was actually writing. I don't know how many books it actually sold. I don't know how many extra, you know, how many extra views I got on my ESPN stuff, but I do know that the PBS NewsHour would see a tweet of mine and then suddenly my phone would ring. Or I would tweet and then CNN would call. Or I would send out another tweet or send out a tweet thread and a magazine would call asking if you could write a piece for them. So suddenly, so there's a professional utility in that. That is actually something of real professional value in terms of your visibility. And the other thing that it absolutely does too, you know, and Kate, I saw you were tweeting out or not tweeting, you were posting your books on Instagram yesterday, which I saw. And I think about my own books. And when you go to sales and marketing and they're deciding and trying, everyone's trying to figure out at the house how much of an advance to give you and how much emphasis they're gonna put in you know how much they're going to promote your book they're looking at your social media feeds they want to know how many twitter followers you've got how many ig followers you've got how many facebook followers you've got these things directly impact your bottom line if you have zero social media presence unless you're already big time you're losing money you're costing yourself money this is the kevin hart thing right kevin hart said you pay me to be in the movie you pay me to do the junkets and the red carpets and the interviews you don't pay me for my social media if you want me to tweet out oh go see the movie go catch the movie that's an extra fee on top of what what you've already paid me and as a result i think they've changed that in a lot of hollywood contracts now Mm -hmm. i'm sure now they write by the way you are also expected to promote this on social media um, the, the what the, the reason why I brought up the the first news story that you learned from Twitter is because I look at that as the top the moment where we were trained or we started to be trained when you need to find out about news about some something that's happened this is where you go first for a basketball writer like myself hoops hype used to be 
every morning. You wake up, you go to this website called Hoops Hype. Hoops Hype was basically a amalgamation of all the biggest headlines from all the local papers all around the country. So if Paolo Bancaro hates his head coach in Orlando because uh, the guy for the Orlando Sentinel wrote it, it'd be right there in Hoops Hype in the morning. And you check it two or three times a day. This is before I was even a writer, when I was working for the team. We used to have to print out Hoops Hype several times a day and hand it out around the office. So everyone kept up to speed. And Twitter, while Hoops Hype still exists, Twitter kind of like devastated that because it became, rather than something that was updated two or three times a day, became a constant. So now I'm trained. I want to know what's happening. I don't turn on my TV at all. I don't watch Sports Center. I don't watch NBA Countdown or Game Time or whatever. I go to Twitter. All the highlights. All the big stories, all the transactions, they're all there. And from there comes the inflection point, where, which Howard alluded to is like this need for speed. The speed in itself doesn't matter. If I find out from Howard five seconds after I've Kate tweeted it, it's negligible. An hour from now, I won't remember who had it first. But we started to attach social currency to the speed, and also the proliferation. This one got 7,000 retweets. This one only got 600. Oh, this is the one we want. What does it mean? It doesn't mean anything. It's all meaningless because at the end of the day, much like Howard using the example, trying to explain to me that regardless of whether Elon meant to do the whole obfuscation thing with check marks and official or whatever or not, the end result is what? We are muddying the waters, and we are creating the opportunity for propaganda to rule the day. That's the point. The end result is the point, regardless of the path, whether it's intentional or not. It's the same thing here. Your end result is learning who got traded, who got fired, who got promoted. Who gives a shit? Who, who, told, you, also, who told you first or whatever? I mean, the, the way I think, the way I've thought about Twitter for the last five years, I've tried to shift my thinking away from, does it have utility? Because the answer there is yes. On some level or another, there is utility. I think there's more utility for somebody like my mom who doesn't ever tweet, so doesn't have to, and isn't using it to promote anything. She just likes to gather information from Twitter. Do you think Twitter. there's more utility for the consumer than there is for the I think it's less complicated for someone like my mom than it might be for me because one, my mom is not risking anything. So, cause she's not tweeting and for her, it might be stealing or, and I'm using my mom as like an example of like a, an, you know, a casual consumer of it who isn't using it for business purposes. It might be stealing her attention from other things that she could be doing. Mm -hmm. But for me, there's a huge cost. So it's like, does Twitter have a utility? Yes. Is it a net positive? No, not for me. Like I, I see the value of it, but the costs of being on it are higher for me than the value I get back from it. Walk, because, that. well, because the same reason the, the positives are many of the things we've said. I learn about things faster. Not sure how much value I attach to that. If Does it matter if I learned something at 323? If I would have learned it by my friend calling me later that night? I don't know. Do I need to know it for those couple hours? Negligible. There is, There has been historical value in, I tweet out a link to an article. Maybe a couple hundred people out of you know whatever followers I have. Maybe it's a little bit of additional traffic. Maybe when I write a book, I get a couple dozen people buying it. I mean, I, I spend a lot of time on Instagram looking at to actually sell one unit of something. How many followers do you have to have? Mm -hmm. And it's a lot. I mean, to sell, I have, I have almost 40,000 followers on Instagram. And when I try to, if I try to sell a book to all 40,000, maybe I'm going to sell 40 or 50, right? I'm not direct, selling direct mail. I'm not, it's basically, yeah, I'm it's the, shit yeah. That you, the coupons in your mailbox. Exactly. I'm not, it's like, I have 40,000 followers. If I put up a post with a book link, like I'm not getting hundreds of people to buy that book. Mm. I might over the course of a year, get 40 of them. I mean, that's so anyway, I digress a little bit, but 
But there is utility on Twitter in terms of like those things, a few books, a few articles. So yes, there is a positive. What's the negative? For someone like me, maybe not for you, Amin, the true anxiety it might cause me if I send out a tweet and I've missed an angle of it and then people are responding and I've missed something in my thought process and I feel like I'm exposed a little bit. I don't, I don't enjoy that feeling at all. Not to mention that I want to create things that are lasting to some degree. And I also like the work process of truly feeling like I have immersed myself in a subject mm -hmm. and lost time learning it. Twitter does not give me any of those. In fact, it sucks away my ability to do all of that. So it's like, so what have I, what have I sacrificed to the gods of Twitter to have some followers and to sell a couple dozen books? Maybe a whole lot of better thinking and a whole lot of projects that like in the long run might be more lasting. You hope you can do both of them, but the amount of time it takes, like last night we were talking, we had some people over and they're in the restaurant business, but you're not just in the restaurant business anymore. Mm -hmm. You're you're in the content business. Instagram. And, and, yep. and if you wanna then, regardless of getting people into your restaurant, like one, you're in the content business of selling your product via Instagram and then if you want to do a cookbook and you're a chef and you don't have a following on TikTok, you might as well just be living in, you know, Siberia. And so, uh, so to me, that's like the, the main thought process, why I'm trending toward deleting my Twitter account, sort of like Elon Musk being like the little nudge that's making me reconsider all of this. Like, is it useful? Yes. But is it a net positive for me? No. Well, and I think it's also important to remember for me, the, um, the toxic nature of the interactions. Are the interactions enjoyable? To a means point when we first started this conversation, of uh, a daily dose of people dunking on each other, right? A daily dose of people being incredibly cruel to one another. And I don't, you know, I think that life has always been what you choose to emphasize. And for me, it was always a very interesting balance of trying to emphasize the people who really make you laugh and the cat videos that you laugh at and the things that you may not see um, in other mediums against the constant barrage, uh, the political barrage, the, the barrage of cruelty, and obviously the, the one-upsmanship, and the fact that people are tracking you to try and catch you in some form of inconsistency to attack your profession. I mean, I look at this, generally speaking, I'm looking at this from a journalistic perspective. I'm looking at it from a professional perspective. And also from a personal and political perspective, I believe that it's a toxic site and it, that, that it did tip. You know, t Twitter reminds me of what I always used to say about or what I always say about New York City, you know, that New York gives you energy and New York takes it away. And the minute it takes away more than it gives you, it's probably not going to be the place for you because it's so overwhelming. And so uh, when I think about the, the site in general, like one of the biggest things that had been in play for years, and it has never been corrected, there had been talk about it earlier this year, was the edit button, the edit feature. Like Twitter has been positioned since its inception as a living, on the record, under oath transcript. I don't view it that seriously. If I make a mistake because my autocorrect, you know, made, you know, a, a, a misspelling, I would like to be able to edit that and that culture, the culture of that site prohibited that. And so what that does, you know, unlike Instagram, unlike Facebook, where, you know, you make a mistake or you want to change what you say, or you change your mind, you can change it because Twitter prevents that. It creates a very, very different dynamic. So when you delete a tweet, now you have people coming after you like you have something to hide. You know, I mean, it, and it really does treat the interactions as though um, it's evidence. And that is a very, very different dynamic than just hopping on Twitter and having fun and you know being in it. As Babani always says, I'm just in it for the jokes. It's not a place that's only about the jokes. Here's another interesting thing, because many of the criticisms that we're talking about here could apply to all social media. But some are, as what Howard, like the edit button, are more specific to Twitter. 
the thing that I find most interesting that is that of the major social media platforms, Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, TikTok, Twitter has the lowest penetration across the country. What makes Twitter special, different, influential, is many of the people charged with creating the discourse in the nation are on it. Right. It's direct access to celebrity. It's direct. It's direct. More than celebrity. More than celebrity. The media. The media. So, uh, what a great example. I I remember watching. I wish I remember what was the the name. It was on PBS, and it talked about the 2016 election, and how the majority of America in the primaries did not think of Donald Trump as like a real thing. It was he's the guy from TV, and he's running, and whatever. But Trump would say all this ridiculous stuff on Twitter. All the media people were incensed. How could this guy, this awful person, who's proving himself awful every single day on this medium, be taken seriously? So they started to cover him more in an effort to quote-unquote expose him as the guy they knew from Twitter. When in essence all they did was give him the promotion that he needed to give him that bump in the primary that led to all the stuff that led to later. Now, the interesting thing is most of the voting public did not know about any of this shit on Twitter, but they were then made aware of him and some of his other stuff, and that's the stuff that resonated with the people that voted for him. And so Twitter is this weird place where it's way more important to the media than it is to anyone else. But as a result, it can influence, it's almost reversed. Rather than the media influencing what's on Twitter, Twitter influences what the media covers. I've seen this myself uh, working on shows at ESPN where some days it's just like, well, what's on Twitter today? And oh, a lot of people were arguing, a lot of people being like, what, 500 people? They were arguing, is LeBron really uh, greater than uh, Michael Jordan or, or should the Lakers trade Anthony Davis maybe? It's crazy how many, how many, Actual pieces of content, whether it's TV shows, whether it's podcasts by reputable people in the know, germinate from the musings of some maniac on Twitter or on, on Reddit also is another place that gives birth to this stuff. And in essence, something that would have been the domain of a few, a handful, hundred people, is then made the national agenda by the media houses of the day which then in turn feeds everyone else. Like, oh, this is some shit we should care about. Why? Because I saw it on this program or I heard it on this podcast. When in reality, that program, that podcast, just gleaned it off of a conversation on Twitter that they might have been having or they might have been observing that seems like a lot. 500 people talking about something seems like a lot until you realize, man, that's a, a drop in. It's not even a drop in the bucket. In the words of Brian Winhurst, it is the perspiration on the outside of the bucket. <laughs> a good line yeah the the scale question when it comes to twitter that i mean you're pointing out is is always one that i'm paying attention to it it, because in in similar fashion it's you know from a pop culture perspective maybe chrissy teigen's a bad example because she has said a lot of gnarly stuff but it might be chrissy teigen being attacked on on twitter and like you said it's like what is it eight or nine people have I mean, this is a bad example because she actually has had but, some drama. But like, whatever still, it then is. even even wh- whatever if she it said is. something reprehensible, if it's a thousand people talking about it, who gives a shit? <laughs> like, right. it's not news. All right, go be a weirdo over there. But we treat it as news, in part because our for many media people, their lives exist on this app, right? All their interactions. A lot of the sourcing, all that stuff, right? But then the other thing is, and this is the the uniquely the um, the limitations of the human brain. If I open my Twitter right now and I find a thousand mentions, a thousand separate people said, "I mean, what an asshole!" What you said on Metal Larkers Fifty Three. It's impossible for my brain to be able to process. That's not that many people. A thousand people. I can't keep scrolling. It's all unread messages. It's not that many people. If I, if I wanted to sell them a ticket for a dollar, 
to fill yeah. a venue. Madison Square Garden would look deserted. Yeah, not- or you can just look at the percentages. I mean, what do you have? hundred? I don't know, 100,000 followers? I don't even know how many followers you have on Whatever. Twitter. Yeah, Whatever. It's, it's, yeah. Let's say it's, it's 0.7% of your followers. It's not a terrible ratio, but... Okay, and uh, Howard, before we let this episode go, although we probably could go for a while on this, what was the calculation you made about leaving Twitter? Because last week when we were talking, you know, we're still talking through like, you know, the way sources can contact you, book deals, like why why give it up if it's an asset that you don't have to feed or populate? What was the what was your thinking in saying, no, my decision is like I need to leave it? Yeah, well, that that was the, the calculation. The calculation was based on the professional necessity of having it, the visibility to have it, the ability to be accessed, not just to access other people, but for them to get a hold of you. Um, my feeling had been, well, I have a very specific belief of the place that this site holds, both for me personally, you know, people have been calling it a cesspool for a long time. I have for a long time been trying to balance whether or not it was something that I wanted to maintain. I'm absolutely going to miss the tennis community. I love the interactions, the live tweeting of the matches. One of the things about Twitter that we didn't talk about was it's, it is one of the few community spaces where you were, everybody's watching the Oscars or everybody's watching mm-hmm. the Grammys or whatever. The people who you are in, interacting with over common interests, especially sporting events, it's one of those rare public forums where you, you're all watching and interacting on the same event which is always very funny for the person who's not watching that game when somebody goes, what was that, right? If you're not watching the game, you have no idea what, what was that, you know, what that pronoun is referring to. And so that was one of the really big questions about the, you know, how much of that interaction you really want. But the biggest reason for me to decide that this wasn't it was one, the trend of misinformation, uh, the trend of where the site is going, my feelings about, why Elon Musk purchased it, Um, my feeling about values, about how can we talk about things that we feel are disruptive and then do nothing about it? Are we, am I walking the walk based on how I feel about what this site represents? There is a balance. There's absolutely a professional cost that I think you pay for not being involved in it. But I also know that for the past six or seven years, there's, you know, I have felt that this site is adding to social ills that I think are hurting us. And especially in terms of the journalistic, the professional piece of it. I believe that public journalism is under assault by celebrities, by government, by everybody. I believe that as a person, as a professional. And so I felt like, um, do I want to live tweet tennis and ignore that? Especially when the person who bought it, like I said before, If Elon Musk had bought it as a business acquisition, I probably would have kept my account. But I believe there's something greater afoot here. And I didn't really want to be part of it. And I also felt like there was life before Twitter. There was MySpace and Tumblr and and Pinterest, the rest of it. There'll be something else um, that I will feel more comfortable contributing to. Parlor. I'm kidding. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> well, and also, yeah. and I, I mean, I think that's, but I think that's a really important thing. As much as we joke about, you know, who's a moron and who's not, think about the powerful people and why they're buying into the information business. Look at what Zuckerberg had been going through during the 2016 election. Look at the people who are buying these sites and why it's not a trivial thing. Yeah. Right. You have influence here. And, you know, what really pisses me off about this sort of stuff is how when you talk about the actual infrastructure, people look at you like you're being hyperbolic. When actually these these are the mediums and these are the pathways that people use to access information. Yeah, I mean, I think it's and I do think it's interesting because I, I do feel like as we move into these different spaces, there will be something else. Jack Dorsey is already talking. The founder of Twitter is already concocting blue sky so there will be other places and other mediums and and i think that one of the things about this talk that i sort of appreciate is the idea of unintended consequences um 
I don't think Twitter had ever, in, we had anticipated that this would become this place that would become indispensable to your sourcing. But at the same time, it has. And I think it'll be really interesting to see what these industries do. Um, you know, all the sports teams have a Twitter feed. Maybe, maybe they move those feeds to some places, someplace else. Maybe they just sort of multitask and we'll see what happens with the site. But it is a very interesting moment in time and uh, I'm glad we got a chance to talk about it as we move on to Meadow Lockers 55 next week. Do we have any final thoughts, Kate Fagan? No, I, I got to make a decision, Howard. <laughs> let it, let it rip. Decide. So defeated right now. It's like, no. I mean, I, I have a book coming out in March, and I just like selfishly uh, feel like. Well, and that, that oh. is a good thing. Like, Kate, let me throw one last thing at you on this. 20. 15, 2016, maybe, I can't remember, we had our spring training summit at ESPN. And we, I think it might've been Lauren Reynolds who came in and she was the social media director and she gave her presentation. And one of the questions that we were having was, how much impact does this social media have? How much impact is it actually having on our stories? And her presentation was fascinating because it had said at the time, I don't know if it's changed since obviously it's six years later, but it took something like 100,000 retweets to have any significant movement on page views. Facebook was better. Facebook was in the Facebook, 20 or 30,000 range. And so then you start thinking, how many of the 126,000 tweets I had made since 2009 reached that threshold? How many books are you actually sell selling? Yeah. How much visibility is it actually giving you? It's a really it's good question. It's a mirage. It's a mirage. Full, it full feels, circle. yeah. Full circle. It's not about how many units it moves. It's about convincing the people, the powers that be. Oh, no, look at me. I'm important. Look how many tweets yep. I uh, retweet. And, and, there, and therefore, yep. I need an extra thirty, forty thousand dollars $40,000 in my advance because I can actually have, I have a reach that's yep. going to make your money back. And so, Even though my social will end up selling seven books, but you it think looks. it's going to sell ten thousand. So, so what's going to happen the next time I go and you know talk to my publisher? Luckily, I have a couple of years before I have to make this call again. That they look and say, "Well, you used to have seventy-four thousand Twitter followers, and now you don't even have a Twitter account. Did I just cost myself ten grand or more, or what?" Good question. Um, we will see you all next week on Metal Lockers 55. Early honorary captain for me is Tim Lincecum, San Francisco Giants two-time Cy Young Award winner. And not okay, Jason. So I, have, I don't Jason have Williams anybody, well. so yeah. Are you going white chocolate? I was going with that, Jason Williams. Wasn't he 55 also? He was 55 mm -hmm. also. Indeed. We will see you all next week.